On the 5th of December 1952, an unusually heavy fog descended on London in the UK. It remained in place for five days, bringing the capital to a standstill, and yet it caused no panic. Fog was a common phenomenon within London and, as dramatic as this fog was, it was thought of as just another example of typically British weather. It wouldn't be until much later that the true cost of the Great Smog of 1952 was realised. London is an incredibly densely populated city. With so many people and so much industry concentrated in one place, it has always suffered from poorer air quality than other cities in the UK. Even in Victorian times, the city was infamous for its foggy streets. Writers at the time referred to these fogs as pea supers, an allusion to the colour and density of the fog being similar to that of soup. There was some improvement in London's air quality as the city entered the 1900s, but by 1952, pollution was still very much a problem. At that time, coal was still a common power source with numerous coal-burning power plants situated within the boundaries of London. Coal was also an important domestic fuel. Londoners had been burning a great deal of it to heat their homes during the particularly cold winter of 1952. With the Second World War having concluded less than a decade ago, resources were still a little thin on the ground. Most people, therefore, were reduced to burning low-quality coal, which didn't combust very cleanly. The sum of all these factors was that London produced a huge amount of air pollution. Weather conditions on the 5th of December 1952 conspired to trap this pollution within the city. A complete lack of wind combined with a zone of high atmospheric pressure effectively pushing the warm air rising from chimneys and smokestacks straight back down to street level. The byproducts of domestic fireplaces and factories all over the city quickly formed a foggy blanket thick enough to cover all but the tallest of buildings. The fog was severe on the first day, and it got worse with each day that passed, with factories continuing to belch pollution into the atmosphere at an astonishing rate. A million kilograms, or 1,000 metric tonnes of smoke, and 2 million kilograms, or 2,000 metric tonnes of carbon dioxide, for example, were released each and every day, swamping the city. Londoners were used to fog, but this was on another level. This fog was extremely thick and dense, restricting visibility to just a few strides. In some places it had a yellowish or greenish hue, and many reported that it stank of rotten eggs, something which led people to don masks or other face coverings whenever they had to venture outside. Despite the noxious appearance of the fog, few people were worried about air quality. Visibility was a much more pressing issue. The city's transport networks seized up. Barely any planes could take off or land, and the vast majority of flights were diverted to other airports. Buses and other forms of above-ground public transit were cancelled, as drivers simply couldn't see far enough to safely complete their routes. This left the London Underground as the only available means of public transport for millions of Londoners. Private transport was equally affected. Roads became blocked by multiple accidents, and even those roads that were still moving were doing so with agonising slowness. While the fog caused travel chaos, it also represented an opportunity for thieves. With almost zero visibility and police unable to get around, crime skyrocketed. There were hundreds of reports of robberies and muggings, with the thieves getting away under cover of the fog. In addition to this wave of opportunistic crime, most ordinary activities came to a halt. Sporting fixtures were called off when it became apparent that the spectators could not see the players, the players could not see one another, and nobody at all could see the ball. Workers were sent home from their offices, or could not make it into work in the first place. Schools were closed, and even theatre performances were affected. 
several were cancelled when fog seeped in through windows and doors and filled the auditorium. Personal accounts from those who were alive at the time give some idea of what it must have been like to navigate London during the smog. People recall feeling their way along hedges on their way to school, and holding hands with their friends so as not to become separated. Elsewhere, commuters were escorted through the streets by policemen bearing torches, or else used the light glinting off overhead electric trolley lines to find their way. When, or if, people arrived at their destinations, many found their clothes blackened with soot, and couldn't stop coughing for days. Some people reported taking lamps out into the street, and still seeing nothing. Around the Isle of Dogs, many people noted that the fog was too thick for them to even see their own feet. Doctors found themselves in high demand, but at the same time, struggled to complete house calls because of the fog. Given that the underground was the only remaining viable way to get around, queues for tickets stretched into the thousands. For five days, London endured the Great Smog, and then, as the weather changed, the fog cleared away. The city, which had been trapped in a perpetual twilight for five long days, started moving again. Roads cleared, bus services resumed, and Londoners returned to work after one of the strangest weekends that many had ever experienced. It took some time before the real impact of the fog was known. Respiratory illness is a quiet killer, and in this case, those it killed were mostly the sick or the elderly. Doctors in hospitals across the capital noted that they'd experienced an unusually high level of mortality during the fog, and doubtless made an association between the two. The average Londoner, however, had no reason to think that the smog was anything other than just some very severe inclement weather. Months would pass before the wave of deaths and respiratory illnesses was noticed. And even once it had been noticed, the impact was extremely difficult to gauge. Many of those who were affected didn't pass away during the fog, but instead had their lives massively shortened. Someone who died prematurely from respiratory illness a year after the Great Smog, for example, might not have been counted as part of the death toll. Even so, the most conservative estimates as to the number of deaths state that at least 4,000 people were killed by the smog. The smog and the chaos it caused were a wake-up call for many. Hundreds of those who endured it noted that the experience changed their attitude towards the environment. It certainly moved air quality up the political agenda, and in 1956 the Clean Air Act was introduced. This legislation made mandatory the use of smokeless fuels in built-up areas, and also limited the amount of air pollution factories were allowed to disperse into the atmosphere. While the Act itself has been updated and replaced several times over the years, many of its principles have remained in place to this day. As a consequence, the air quality in London has significantly improved. The most visible and odorous pollutants have been cracked down on particularly hard, leaving the city looking and smelling far better than it might have done 70 years ago. It is unlikely that there will ever be another incident like the Great Smog of 1952. However, the problem of air pollution in the city has not been resolved. By some estimates, almost 4,000 Londoners die prematurely each year as a result of air pollution. That's the same number as were killed by the Great Smog. In contrast to the Great Smog though, these deaths occur year on year, and are considered largely unremarkable. The Great Smog of London was dramatic and terrifying for those who endured it, but the dramatic nature of it was what opened the door to such decisive and meaningful change in the aftermath. Politicians and lawmakers couldn't ignore the issue of air pollution when they could both see and smell it in their streets. Given that another smog is unlikely to hit the city today, the issue of air pollution is one which still looms large, 
but which, at the same time, has become very easy to ignore.